All right, welcome back to Soccer Matters here on ESPN 97.5, as always presented by John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. It's daspitlaw.com. Look, uh, we appreciate John and his firm getting soccer on the airwaves. By the way, it's 20 years now we've been doing soccer on the radio. So, uh, you know, we're all pretty proud of that fact. And it's been on a couple of different networks here in Houston. But really, uh, the majority of our stay has been here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. And that's aided by John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. So, Big thank you all around to uh, the station and our presenting sponsor. It allows us to bring on the Dynamo General Manager, Pat Onset. Pat, thank you uh, for coming on. Uh, I promise you this won't be a 35-minute interview. <laughs> you never know if I start talking. We might be here for a while. <laughs> well, I think everybody's loving the transparency. So, so I would go right to that. You know, this club was without a face of the franchise. Is that something you're grabbing the mantle to? to be the face of the franchise when it comes to communication and like every good business, you got to have it. Yeah. I don't know if I'm the face of the franchise. I, I mean, I, I think people that, that have known me for a long time know that's just kind of how I operate. I'm pretty open and sometimes to a fault, but, but uh, I've always felt comfortable talking about my ideas and what I'm thinking about and where I want to go. I don't think it's uh, I don't think there's a lot of secrets out there. So uh, you know, we're trying to get better. That, that's the bottom line. And, and uh, I don't mind describing the, pro the process and my thought process uh, and how to get there. It, it may change and, and I'm open, uh, open to change and, and, and uh, having a different, different uh, method of doing things. But at, at the same token, uh, I, don't, I don't mind walking through that thought process. Pat, you got your striker over the line, Sebastian Ferreira. You, you got him over the line. What's the next vital priority now for you with this team positionally? I, I, I think there's a couple. There's there's one is uh, uh, you know Seba's a, a, a great forward. He's a guy who has excellent movement in the box. Uh, he's got a history of scoring goals. He knows how to do that. He works very hard off the ball. Uh, gives you a lot of work rate uh, defensively. Uh, but he's not a guy that's going to run in behind and pull away from teams. He can still do it and still test the back line, but. He's better kind of in front of the defenders. And then his movement in the box is excellent. Uh, then uh, for those type of strikers uh, to be successful, you got to get them service. So for us, uh, it's, it's twofold. Uh, to me, it's, it's two positions. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a 10 per se, but maybe like an eight slash 10, a guy can kind of provide a final pass or set up our wingers our wide play uh, so they can get crosses in the box. Uh, and then I think uh, one more wide guy as well. Uh, that, that's uh uh, one of those two would probably be a young, uh, a YPS player, you know, 22 or younger, one of those initiatives. Uh, that's the plan. Uh, and from there, uh, we still have a DP spot to go on, on, on the other position. So uh, I think it'll depend on the profile, the players that we're looking at uh, in terms of where, which uh, one is the DP and which one is the YPS. But uh, that's what I expect uh, in the next two signings. All right. With, without that player in house right now, um, you know, what's the conditions with Darwin Quintero? Look, we know he's a talented soccer player. We do know he's an older soccer player. His contract was redone. Um, you know, have you had a conversation with him? Is he a guy that's going to be someone that comes off the bench against fatiguing defenders? I mean, how do you utilize him until you get that playmaker that you're kind of opting for? Well, that's one of the reasons we signed him. I, I think was uh, to a certain extent, I think we see the qualities he has offensively. I mean, he's an excellent, excellent player uh, offensively. And those players are very difficult to find uh, no matter what age you're at. Um, obviously, clearly he's probably not in his prime like he was, you know, six, six years ago or so, or so forth. But uh, what he does offer uh, on the ball is uh, there's very few guys in our league that can do that. So that's one of the reasons we brought him back. Uh, we also felt it would buy us a little bit of time to make sure that we got that piece right. Uh, so he's a guy I expect to see on the field and he's fighting for minutes right now in training. Uh, I'll give him credit. I think he was he, in the meeting and I've, I've gone on record in saying that. And he said, I want to be here. This is the club I want to play for. This is where I want to finish my career. Uh, this is, this is, this is, I'm excited about what you're selling uh, and I want to be a part of it. So uh, when you have a player like that, you're excited, especially a guy as talented as him. So, so now uh, what I would say is give him a lot of credit in the off season is he's, he's one of the guys he spent the most time of any player in this club here at, at the HSP and working in the off season, which I don't know he hasn't done in the past, but uh, he's trying to show and, and try to prove that he can get on the field and, and give him as many minutes as possible. So he's fighting for that in the first week here. And it's nice to see him on the field. I mean, he is a, he is a talented soccer player. 
Yeah, in fairness to you, you weren't, you know, you obviously weren't here last year, but this was a guy that clearly was not fit. And for him being on that salary, that leaves a little bit of a question mark in the minds of fans as to how bought in he is. But, but maybe under this new regime, uh, he is. I move on to Coco Karaskia, Pat. Oh, uh, yeah. I, well, before we go to Coco, I want to go back to Darwin a little bit because yep. uh, that was something I'd heard. And, and uh, uh, you know, not not just me. I, I didn't just challenge him. The high performance department challenged him and said, listen, if you want to be successful and you want to be a part of this team and get on the field, uh, you need to come in here and you need to work in the offseason. And uh, to his credit, he's done that. And you can see in games now, just, I was just walked off the field watching a five aside. And when he gets on the ball, he's always dangerous. So uh, I have to give him a lot of credit. He, you know, he's so far he's put his money where his mouth is, and and hopefully he continue that and and show it on the field. And, uh, All right, that's regard- good to hear. That's good yeah. to hear from you, but and that's great. I understand. I understand the concern, um, but there's also a reason uh, we we found a price point that I think both parties were happy with, and uh, that that's why he's back this year. Excellent. How about Coco Karaskia? What's your thoughts on him? Yeah, he, for me, he's a tough one because I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him play. You know, I've seen him train once, uh, and I've seen him play with Panama. That's that. That's about it. So, uh, for us, I think for for Paulo especially is for him to get an opportunity to watch him, uh, see him train uh, firsthand. Uh, the question I would have is, can he be the guy that makes the final pass? If you're playing in a four three three, for example, can he be? one of the two guys in the eights positions that can, that can make that final pass. We don't know. I think we'll learn more as we go, go about this thing here uh, and, and take our time kind of evaluating what we have and how that will fit into the way Paulo wants to play. But uh, he's a very talented player. Uh, his, his certainly his last kind of outing with the national teams in the last hexagonal games, he was outstanding. Um, so we're, we're excited to kind of see him play here these next three games coming up uh, on starting Thursday. East Houston Dynamo General Manager Pat Onstad joining us. Um, back to the system or the style of play with, with Paolo Nagamura. We know it wants, it's going to be proactive. We've heard you use that word a lot. Is this modeled after the 4-3-3 at Sporting? And, you know, what sort of slight variations do you think we expect from that? And that's if he's determined it at all right now. Yeah, I, I think Paulo's still experimenting with that. I think he has a system he's comfortable with. He's obviously been in the Kansas City system. Um, but at the same token, I think it, a lot of that will depend on personnel and where he feels uh, the best fit is for these guys. Uh, when, when we talk about proactive and how we want to play, and I've got Paulo saying that word now. So um, so if he comes on and he starts saying it, uh, I, I just I said just it heard, too. he just heard me saying it nonstop, the poor guy. But I, I would say is. Um, you know, the way he wants to play, the way he wants to press, the way he wants to recover the ball, the way he wants to possess the ball. A lot of that's going to depend on uh, the players that he says, hey, listen, um, you know, one guy I want to actually uh, uh, kind of call out here is, is Memo, who has been uh, had, had an excellent first week. And there's a guy that, that wasn't happy, wasn't sure if he wanted to be or wasn't sure of the plan f- for himself. And has come in with a fantastic attitude and has given everything to Paulo. And Paulo's like, this kid is, you know, he's, he's proving that he should be on the field. So I have to give him uh, memo credit and Paulo credit that the two of them kind of spoke and, and he sees a pathway here to get minutes on the field, which is what, what memo ultimately wants. So Darwin and memo, some might say they don't fit into a four, three, three pressing system. Do you believe if those guys are in your 11, you're going to get enough work ethic out of them to employ that type of a system. If you're going to press and you're going to try to win the ball back, you're going to have to do that. Now can, can Darwin do that for 90 minutes? That that remains to be seen. Can, can memo do it for 70, 70 to 90 minutes? I don't know. Uh, um, It's uh, I think there's been guys have seen him enough here and in in this uh, city uh, to see which one you'd probably put your money on, but at the same token, uh, they're both talented players. And I think they play a major role in us being successful uh, this season. Pat Onstead, Dynamo General Manager, joining us. Okay, so we didn't touch on the on the pivot and whether you're going to play with a single, a double pivot, however it's going to come out. But nobody really wanted that job last year. Uh, between Derek Jones, Matias Vera, Darwin Seren, nobody was consistent enough. And you saw it. This team leaked a lot of bad goals. Yep. Um, I was a little surprised that you didn't talk about wanting to sign a defining six or somebody that can really make that midfield grow a few inches. Yeah. I mean, it's still a possibility. I, I think evaluating Mateus uh, has, has been in here for two days. So 
uh, he, he took a little while to get in here. Uh, had, had some uh, medical issues, I guess you'd say. And and I, I don't know if it's been out there, so I don't want to say it out, out loud, but I think we, we know what's going on in this world at this stage. So uh, he's a little behind. So we'll have to try to see, if, get him caught up as quick as possible and evaluate that to see if uh, that's a position he can play on his own. Uh, Derek has been obviously in there right now in this last week, trying to show what he can do. Uh, maybe we have to end up going with with two sixes uh, or or possibly with uh, if you have protection of two eights in front of you, is that enough protection that when you're in a low block, maybe you're in a four one four one. It it really will depend on our personnel uh, and, and how it'll kind of shape up. But uh, you're right. Last year, I don't think anyone did kind of grab that position and, and run with it. I think uh, Mateus obviously tab tab had hoped to try to get him a little higher up the field and felt he could be the guy making the final pass. But. Um, we'll see how this goes in preseason. Yeah, the reason I, I go there is because it is really the same players, uh, unless you feel there's a way of getting more out of them. I mean, every pretty much combination was tried, you know, last year to, to the credit of Tab Ramos and trying to get it right. Yeah, uh, and I think that's where I, I agree with you. I think the, the it is the same players at this point in time. Um, I'm hoping to try to change that to a certain extent. Um, and hopefully we'll have that, uh, the sooner, the sooner, the better, but at the same token, I do think when you have players in a new regime, a new coach, uh, you do often see, especially early on a nice little bump. Uh, the question is, can we sustain it? Can, can, uh, Paulo, Paulo get the most out of these guys? And, uh, we're hoping that, uh, he can definitely get a bit of a spike from these guys. Dynamo general manager, uh, Pat Onstad joining us here. Uh, very excited to have him on the show tonight. This is all great information. Um, as always, um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, uh, I was always interested, you know, since you've gotten this Sebastian Ferreira signing over the, you know, over the finish line. And I heard some of uh, your quotes and saw some of your quotes and, and I find it very interesting. I don't think us and the public understand how these deals go down. There's a lot of probably crazy twists and turns. What about like when, when you did this with Lucas Zellerian in Columbus and, and, you know, what were some of the hurdles getting a quality player like that here that ultimately helped win an MLS Cup? Yeah, I think um, in that situation, you know, the, the number one thing is you have to get a head coach on board. Uh, and, and in Columbus, uh, you know, we had a head coach that believed in Lucas and, and we'd had some other targets that, that we liked that were a little bit younger. But uh, the head coach at that stage uh, spoke very highly of him and said he wanted to get him. So in the end there, you have to just make sure that you have a budget going in and what you're willing to spend and what the ownership group is willing to spend. And Tim Bezbachenko helped with that. Uh, certainly uh, knowing what we could spend. Uh, we actually went down, down the road with another player fairly far, uh, but couldn't get it over the line. And, and uh, fortunately for us, uh, you know, or sorry for Columbus at that time, uh, the, the right player got picked. Pat Onstad joining us here. Uh, is, is it tougher for you to negotiate deals within the league? And, in, and probably I would imagine it's a little less internationally, but is it tougher being a team that was last in the Western Conference last year? I mean, do, do people feel they can try to take advantage of you guys because of where you are and get you to maybe overpay or overcommit in deals? Yeah, and the rookie jam as well. You want to get, you get tested out a little bit. <laughs> well, um, I wouldn't but, say yeah. you're a rookie. You've done no, a no of it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. It, it is, uh, you know, when, you, when you're one of the top teams, everybody wants your players. Your players are the best players in the league. When, you, when you're one of the weaker teams, then unfortunately no one wants your players and you certainly can't get full value for them. So it does make it difficult to make moves. Uh, one of the other things for us is, uh, you know, um, they made a very, very hard push at the end to try to make this team work and try to get into the playoffs. So a lot of the money that you maybe could, could, could spend to try to get a trade within the league is, is not there right now for us. We'd have to pull that forward, uh, from next year. And that to us, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I think we could pull a little bit of money forward, but we don't want to commit all of next year's money for, uh, uh, right now, and then we're stuck next year back back in square one again. So uh, our plan, we're kind of limited in those games, you know, with the Paul Areola sweepstakes. We're, we're never in that running. We're, we're not able to spend uh, $2 million in GAM to try to try to get a player of that quality. So uh, we have to kind of pick and choose who we're going after, and we have to make sure we get it right. So the biggest thing for us is not to rush into decisions. Uh, we took our time with Sebastian uh, Ferrer, and I think we made a really good choice. Uh, the same token, the other players that we're talking about, you know, we're going to take our time and make sure that we get these players right. That's the most important thing. 
Pat, your sporting director, Asher Mendelson, came out and was talking about the inter international spot acquired from San Jose and obviously the flexibility that brings. How much urgency is there, you know, to get another big signing before we kick things off uh, February 27th? Uh, well, we're hoping to get someone in the building by then. That's the plan. Uh, I don't know if we get two in the building, but hopefully one. Uh, the, the, the window doesn't close until April 20th. So we have some time to get the second one in, but we expect to get both in before, uh, before, before the window closes and that we'll be able to build with this group uh, going into the summer. Are these higher profile type signings uh, based on the context of, of where we are right now? Yeah, I mean, the, the irony with all, all the lack of GAM and the lack of uh, salary cap space is actually going out and getting a designated player that costs roughly 600 against your cap. And then it's the ownership spend, whatever the owner wants to pay. So, for example, you know, Seba, Seba is only 600 against the cap. It's not it's not that difficult to, to, to manage that. And then a YPS player is only 200. So uh, the cap numbers are much. It's more now going to ownership and saying, can we have this money to spend? And uh, as a, hopefully the fans have seen and the media have seen so far is that, is that uh, we're very fortunate to have an owner that is willing to spend and, and help us get better. So we have uh, a budget that we've proposed and that's been agreed upon between ownership and management. And now we're excited to go spend that money and, and try to find the right guys to help improve this team. Yeah. That must be exciting for you as a GM to have these resources and, and really be able to, to think about things. Now, obviously you've got a, you've got a list of players that you're tracking, you're following. I mean, I think you were tracking Sebastian Ferreira before you even got to Houston for, yes. for, for all I know. Yeah. Um, uh, are there some interesting prospects on that list? Obviously, you're not going to give anything away, but this seems to be the biggest piece of interest for Dynamo fans. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, there are. And and I think there's some, uh, like I said, one of them will be young and and one will be a designated player. I don't know what the age will be, probably 23 or older, that that we can almost guarantee, or 24 and older. Um or, or it could be a young designated player, depending on the, the profile, which would be 23 years old. But we're we're look excited about the prospect because uh, we're shopping in a, in, in a it's it's a nice store to go shopping in. It's uh, it was it Neiman and Marcus. It's a, it's a nice store. You know, we're not we're not we're not shopping in, at the bottom basement store. So we're excited uh, about who, who we get to look at. Um, we have we have uh, lots of options at this stage, and now it's really about just narrowing down the profile, finding exactly what. Paulo feels is the best uh, player in the best position, the best fit for our club. Pat Onstad joining us. We had uh, my friend, John Kerr, who's the coach at Duke. I'm sure you yeah. know, John. Yes. Yeah. Um, we had him on talking about Thor, the, the, the striker that you guys drafted. Um, is this a kid you expect to get minutes in MLS in the first year? I mean, can you go out on a limb and say that at this point? Uh, I, 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 I would be hesitant. I uh, would have been really hesitant a few weeks ago, but watching him this last eight, nine days, I think he's going to have an opportunity to get on the field. Uh, I do. Uh, he's granted. He's a bit older than, than some guys that get drafted and he's had uh, pro experience in the sense that he's been in a pro environment in Iceland. And while it's not MLS level, it's still a pro environment. So I, I think, what Thor has and the advantage he has over a lot of these colleges, kid, college kids is that he's seen a pro environment and know what it's like. So he's not overawed by the moment. Uh, and he's, uh, part of that's his confidence, which we've seen on video, yeah. uh, on YouTube video. So he's he's got that swagger about him too, but that's what you need with forwards. And um, uh, the one thing that impressed me is we had a fitness test in terms of kind of a mass run, uh, a maximum run to see how far they can go in a certain time frame, And he was fifth. Uh, which is pretty unheard of for, for a striker. So uh, especially a kid coming out of college. So that, that was impressive. And it showed that he was prepared and ready to go uh, when camp started. Pat, this may be a bit of a strange question, but now that the under 23 team is back here, I mean, that to me is a huge piece of, of, of the overall picture here. However, it happened right down yeah. in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, yeah. I just, from a player development standpoint, it was a tough thing to sell to people. I think that understand, what it takes to develop soccer players. Um, would you have taken this job if, if there wasn't an under 23 team and reserve team in place in house where you can monitor your players? Because this is a big, this is a big tool you guys have now. Yeah, that's a good question. Cause I never really even thought of it. And I think part of it was the fact in Columbus, we were doing the same starting a new team. So I think that was just part of my pathway thought process. And, and I knew before I even took this job that that was the plan that was in place. So 
Uh, I, I don't know if I can answer your question, what I've taken if it wasn't in place. I certainly would have advocated to have that in place. Um, but it is, it is, does help with the pathway. You know, the Juan Castillas is, is uh, and I've gone on record saying this last year was almost a lost year for him. You know, he needed to be, be able to get games week in, week out. You know, obviously he got a uh, last part of this last couple of games of the season. He got some minutes just to get on the field, but that's not developing. Developing is playing week in, week out and actually working on your craft and getting better. And, you know, we have some ideas with that team. I think uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny Bundy's the coach is, is going to be, it's exciting that he's going to be taking that group. And uh, what we're trying to do is push the envelope a little bit in that group. I don't think you'll necessarily see exactly mimic to what we're doing in the first team, but I think we want to push some of these kids like Juan Castilla, if he's going down, for example, we're going to put the number 10 Jersey on him and put some stress on him, put some pressure on him. Like we want, him to be the man and down there and show that he can do that. And that's, if he wants to play in MLS, he needs to be able to do that. And on the second team. So um, it's, it's exciting, I think for the club uh, and certainly for these young kids that have come through our Academy that now there's a clear pathway for them. And it'll be utilized in a lot of different ways. I'm sure. I mean, I, I think the beauty for me is, is if these kids are out there playing and they see Pat Onstad and the staff sit down in the stands that's a different type of pressure. It's obviously great for you to monitor your players. Yeah, it's nice for me to know. Like, I'm still learning the academy guys. They do a great job of kind of keeping me up to date of what's going on. And, and uh, I would say for me, uh, I'm very fortunate. I only have 15 minutes up the road. So that's been, that's, that's been really nice. Being able to pop down and see the occasional academy game quickly uh, is really nice. And I do think well, uh, the longer we're here and the, the clearer the pathway is, it certainly helps for identification. If we're saying, hey, we need to get a young guy for this wide, wide position, but there's also old guys available and we know we have young players coming through. Well, why, why block that player with the young player? Maybe we go get the veteran that we know can maybe push our first team a little bit quicker over the line. But we know in two years time, we've got a, a 15 year old that's going to be playing in the first team. So. Uh, it's important for us to understand each player and how they develop, but also give them a chance to develop and uh, reach their potential. Pat, historically, the Dynamo have not moved players through to the first team. Is, is there a timeline that you have in your head? Have you been able to even get yourself wrapped around that yet with trying to get things in order with a staff where we might begin to see more locals running out of that tunnel uh, at PNC Stadium? Yeah, I don't know if there's a timeline in place. I think when when players are ready to play for the first team, we'll do it. The nice thing is, is one of the reasons we hired Paulo is he has a, he has a track record of playing young kids uh, and moving them up to the first team. So uh, he has a pretty good idea of how uh, the pathway works. Uh, he still wants to win games. That's the bottom line. The first team is about winning games. Uh, development is a small piece of that, but in the end, if that player isn't ready to go and help the first team win, then that player is not going to get minutes. So uh, we, we have to do a good job uh, in the second team to make sure that these guys are ready uh, to be successful, be competitive, be able to compete at that level and, and help contribute to winning games at the first team. Uh, and if we're not doing that, then we're not doing our job uh, preparing them for, for what, it, what uh, lies ahead of them in the MLS. Pat, how's Paulo doing so far in preseason as a head coach? He's undefeated. He's perfect. <laughs> perfect. He's doing great. And now listen, he's, he's been, uh, he's been a pleasure to work with. He's uh, I, I think you've had him on the show uh, and you get to, you get to know him a little bit. He's a uh, very open individual, uh, kind, caring, cares about the players individually. It's important for him to develop these personal relationships with players. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy for coaches. Uh, but I think when the coaches do that and they, they're willing to kind of put their heart and soul into it, get to know these guys as individuals, it really helps. Uh, and, and it helps to be successful. So, you know, we're, we're, we're working hard here behind the scenes. I think, I think one of the big shifts we're having here is we're, we're really trying to change the culture here and it's, it's not easy and it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but we're fortunate. We have a bunch of, of, uh, uh, great players, uh, a bunch of players that are open and, and want change, uh, a great staff here that are going to try to help uh, make this team successful. Your staff as well, obviously a lot of experience there. I mean, that's obviously a move at, at changing the culture as well, I would assume. Yes, it is. Uh, and I think bringing guys from uh, whether, whether they were successful in their playing careers, coaching careers, or, or in uh, successful environments is important. Uh, and I think the other thing, the other point for, for Paulo is to make sure that he is a staff that he trusts that he's comfortable with. They know how he works. 
especially when we hired him fairly late in the process, you know, just before Christmas is when we uh, agreed to terms. Uh, it's important that he feels comfortable. He's, he's one 30 days in right now from, from when he got hired. So for him, if we'd gone and hired a bunch of other staff that he doesn't know, I think it makes it very difficult for him. So you can see already these guys have been working together and they, they understand each other. So uh, it's been nice for the players to be able to see that. And they're all on the same page out there. It's been, it's been uh, pleasant, pleasant to watch. Pat, the, the, the combination of, of healthy pressure, making sure coming to work every day is enjoyable. I mean, these are things you're, you're trying to put in place, correct? Because yeah, let's be yeah. honest, there is a real pressure to turn things around. because Yeah, it's, it's and listen, I'll, yeah it, it is. And I think part of it is competition for places. And, and uh, uh, that's, that's one thing. I mean, we didn't really talk about it too much, but, you know, Adam Lundquist being healthy for, for a full season will help us. Uh, Corey Baird now is back and, and playing. I mean, he, he's a guy who played one game for us last year after a, what was a pretty significant trade in, in, in league trade for, uh, for the club. So, you know, these are guys, yes, while we're not remember so far, we've, you know, sub up top, Steve Clark, we've brought in some depth guys. Um, but I think Corey and Adam are, are almost like new signings for us to get these guys on the field for, for hopefully for 30, 34 games. So, uh, we're, we're trying to create competition for places. Guys have to fight for minutes. Uh, one of the things we implemented in, uh, in, uh, in the season out here, sorry, in training out here is a competition where they're keeping track of scores and how guys are doing and points and whatnot. And, uh, so that just got posted today for the first time. So there's a leader, there's a couple of leaders in there that you wouldn't have expected, but it's good. So there's a lot of trash talking going on today on the field. It was good. It was, uh, enjoyable to watch. Pat, as always, we thank you very much for your time. This is a, a great piece here. A lot of good information for, for uh, not only myself, but Dynamo fans and all of our listeners. Thank you uh, for coming on the show tonight. Uh, thanks for having me, Glenn. Always a pleasure. All right. That's the one and only Pat Onstad, Dynamo General Manager. Uh, quick word here for uh, Advantage BMW in Midtown. Get down there. Uh, ask for Jason. Uh, ask for Justin Stephen Prather. Get down there, uh, get in an X5, get in a sedan. It's Advantage BMW Midtown. You got to go to that location in Midtown. Advantage BMW Midtown. We'll take a break. We got more to come.